In the mix with the Vibe Show. 97.9. Catch a vibe. Vibe Show 97.9. Wow. Happy Monday to everybody out there. Hope everybody had a super blessed day. I'm a little under the weather today, but you know what? I could not miss this interview right here. We have all been waiting on this one. This one is very, very exclusive. And um, I'm super, super excited. Super excited right here. You know, it's an absolute honor and um, a pleasure to bring on my special guest. Um, I'm talking Emmy Award winning Oscar nominated film producer, songwriter, co-founder of Initial Entertainment Group, the very lovely Cindy Cohen. Hey, hey, hey. Hi, how are you? I am doing amazing. How are you doing today? Doing great. I'm doing real good. For a Monday, it's perfect. <laughs> I know, right? It, it, it I, You know, I've been under the weather. It just seems like the weather change and, and, and how it's going or whatever. It just, it's trying to get me, but I'm, I'm not going to let it get me. <laughs> yeah, don't. I can't. I can't. Now, um, I'm super excited. And for me and the team, we want to say thank you so much for allowing us this amazing opportunity, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It's an honor to be on. Now, you know, um, going through and, and, and checking the background and, and doing my research and everything, I'm just absolutely blown away. Now, you know, I would like to begin um, with you being a Harvard graduate, you know, and having that that master's degree, you know, in psychology. Now, what I'm tripping out on is, you know, you have that and that's such a huge um, achievement and that career path could have went that way and been successful with that as well. Now, I'm, I, I want to know, you know, how did you just steer off into the film, entertainment, music world? So um, I took that infamous year off that people do. And I just, that infamous year turned into decades you know, later. <laughs> so I, you know, when I got my degree in psychology, um, I ended up in a hard field. I was, I was actually doing sex therapy and not what people think. I was dealing with a lot of children who were sexually abused by their families and um, I worked with the children and dealt with the courts to decide if they were going back to the families or not. And it was a really difficult business to be in back then. And a lot of times the state would give these children back, even though I had recommended that they not go back to the families. So I took a year off. I got a, a job with um, CBS News. Um, I worked for a while at CBS doing news. Um, and that was interesting in its own right. I've tons of news stories. Um, I ended up leaving news over a story I wouldn't cover, which was a little boy named Adam Walsh, who I don't know if you guys remember, um, there was a little boy who was decapitated in right. Florida, and that's where I lived at the time. And um, his father went on to start America's um, Most Wanted. That was John Walsh. And oh. yeah, and that was a story that the news um, room at the time wanted me to cover because his dad had worked at my father's hotel and I knew where the family was and I refused to, to cover that story. And um, so I knew I was getting out of news and somebody came to me one day that knew my boyfriend at the time and said, could you put lyrics to a song of mine? And I said, absolutely not, I'm not a songwriter. <laughs> he said, but you write copies so quickly for CBS, could you try? And they gave me music and music's my passion. If I, it's the road that I might've should have been on cause I just love music. But um, I tried and I actually delivered, they probably thought I was gonna deliver them a poem and I didn't. I was like, here's the bridge, here's the chorus, here's the verse. And I had taken my junior abroad in London, uh -huh. one man that worked at BMI Music. And um, I sent the song to him and just said, I'm a songwriter, but don't worry, I'll, I'll keep my day job. And he called me, God, a couple of weeks later, and he said, do you have a publishing company? And I said, no, I don't have a publishing company. And he said, well, there's an artist here who wants your song. And I said, I don't even know if my song's for sale, but, right. uh, but okay. 
And it turns out that that was a, um, a, a first time producer named Simon Cowell, who had an artist named Sunita. And that album went top 10 all throughout Europe. And I became wow. a BSM writer and um, it was a crazy time. And then I met um, an artist named Howard Hewitt, who was the one of the lead singers of Shalimar. And um, Howard and I met at a restaurant and he said, what do you do? And I was all full of it then. I'm like, I'm a songwriter. I wasn't. And he said, let me hear what you've got. And then Howard recorded what a, a single of mine that um, went to number three on the R&B charts for, for like Engelbert Humperdinck, just some random things. And then I quit. I just thought there's too many people out there that have studied music and they play all these instruments. And to me, it was a hobby, which, right. um, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And um, interestingly, no one knows me as a songwriter here, but during COVID, when we were locked down and I had nothing to do and I was bored out of my mind, I decided to write a musical short and uh, we're editing it right now. And I wrote three, you know, two of the three songs that are in the movie and um, went ahead and shot it while I um, was locked down. So I'm coming back music world. <laughs> and it was you know, fun years later. That's amazing though, because um, I've had Howard Hewitt on here and um, that's, it's a small world. It's this yeah. entertainment world. It's not as big as people think it is. Yeah. That's right. amazing. Yeah. Now, right. um, going on to um, start the initial entertainment group, um, I like that name. And, and um, I don't know if it's a story that's behind that or why you decided to go with that name or whatever, but curious enough, I would like to know. I don't even remember how we named that. Initial was a strange thing. I was working, you know, I started as a PA, so I tell everybody, start anywhere. I, you know, I was a runaway bride in Florida. I was supposed to get married. I didn't, I knew I just, there was something wrong. And so I moved out to LA under the, the auspices that I would return and ultimately get married. And I never went back. Oh, wow. um, but my family and my boyfriend and everybody thought I was coming back. And, um, I remember I checked into a hotel and I needed a job and I started as a PA and I worked my way up and I learned everything there was to learn. And um, in learning, I realized that the people I were work was working for were crooks and they were stealing a lot of money off sets. And um, the man that also worked at the company at the time that ultimately became my partner kept saying, let's start a company together. Let's start a company together. Um, I think ultimately he wanted my music money. I had made thousand dollars in music. And, you know, I tell people it was crazy what I did. I, it, it was like playing roulette at four in the morning and you kind of want to go to bed, but you kind of want to win. And so you put it all on a certain color. And if you win, you're going to celebrate. And if you lose, you're going to bed. And that's kind of how I started the company. It was crazy. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody else. It wasn't really a business plan. I went out and I found a movie that I wanted to um, get involved with. And that ended up getting an Emmy nomination. And we started the company with the, with the money that I had. And then five years later, we had a couple of Emmy nominations, a Golden Globe, a People's Choice. And I ultimately sold it because I, I hadn't had a vacation in five years. So I kind of just wanted to go back and be a girl, but I ultimately sold it um, on four Oscar nominations. And it was a crazy ride that I still to this day can't tell you how and what we did, but we did it, you know? Yeah, y'all y'all definitely did it. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to ask you too, because um, you kind of covered a lot of the things that I wanted to ask you, which was beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask you about the songwriting process, because you know how um, artists try for so long to try to break into the business or whatever, um, and, and they may be great songwriters, but for whatever reason, um, they don't get picked up or they don't get a label deal or something like that. And they just kind of give up. Can you kind of, you know, but it's real lucrative on the songwriting end as well. And they never really think about that. Can you kind of like um, touch on the process as far as, you know, being a songwriter and actually getting songs to artists or to labels? You know, I I'm one of those weird people that it's hard to duplicate what I've done because I swear somebody blessed me in a previous life and I have this knack of falling up. And I say that in a good way. I'm the luckiest person on the planet. Like 
you know, when I wrote my first song, um, I didn't intend to meet Simon Cowell or go to Sunita. I sent it to somebody that I knew at BMI Music. And so go to whoever you know. You never know who you know is what, mm. what I would say. Um, Howard, I met him at a restaurant called Hamburger Hamlet. I thought I was supposed to pick him up for a movie set. And then he told me he was Howard and I took it upon myself to say, I haven't writ wrote a song for you. Engelbert Humperdinck's nephew, I met at a dinner party and he said, oh, my uncle wants to hear what you've got. So it was my entree into the music business was very different than most people. But what I would say is um, I think the older we get, the more afraid we get. I know mm -hmm. that I don't have the chutzpah that I did when I was young. I wouldn't right. just walk up to somebody and say, I'm a songwriter. Right. But then I did. And you just never know who you're speaking to. I had a story um, that I was telling someone the other day about John Batiste, who, by the way, he just wrote a new song and I think got nominated for a Golden Globe. It's in the cartoon called Soul. Um, I think it's called I Need You. If you guys haven't heard it, this is a shout out to John. Um, I actually was dating somebody um, many years ago who had never had a birthday party before. And he was from Louisiana. And I went to school in Louisiana. So being a good girlfriend, I decided I was gonna hire a real New Orleans marching band that would march up the street and come through my house and play at the pool. And you know, I would serve gumbo and all that stuff. Well, that band was John Batiste. And you know, always be nice to everybody. My ex probably doesn't even realize that John Batiste went on and became John Batiste. I wow. did. I I you know, I, I treat everybody the same. I don't care who you are. And you never know the position someone's going to be in. So John and I still speak. And um, honestly, he's got my favorite song right now. Um, and again, that little meeting, you know, I'd love to use John's music in one of my movies. I definitely will, as a matter of fact. So again, you just never know. It's just relationships, relationships, relationships. Right. Would, would you say, you know, with, with all of the experience and, and years of just being in the business, being around music, um, do you think that, you know, because just like you just described, you know, I feel like the magic could have happened back then like that, you know, because everybody was running around and, and, and you know, everybody was on fire then. And but, you know, things have changed and um, I feel like it's a little bit more difficult for they artists to, yeah. They have changed and they are a little bit more difficult. And we all can bitch about the circumstances that we're, that we have right now. And I'll give you two examples, but let's take myself. Um, I am, these kids that are coming up are so much more advanced than I will ever be. I didn't come up learning everything that these kids know. They're so tech savvy that they're, they're light years ahead of me. They could sit there and write a song or even do a film on their iPhone. And I don't know how to do that. I'd be asking my assistant because she'd be light years ahead of me. <laughs> you know, honestly, but, you know, let's take COVID. When we were, what I said earlier, when we were all locked down with just bitching, we had nothing to do, no income coming in, we're all going to die. You know, every, like all of us were just terrorized. I had to do something. So I channeled by songwriting and um, I knew that a friend of mine was a very big singer from Greece. He was stuck in America. There was no way for him to go back because the border is closed. Right. So anybody can do this. I'm sure that any of the prospective songwriters listening to this have somebody who sings or plays an instrument. All I did was take that situation and turn it into something. And so I ended up writing a musical short. I, I hadn't written in a while. I wanted to come back. And um, and I did. And anybody can do that. Nowadays, there's all these different streaming platforms. You, I, can, I don't know what I'll do with my short yet because we're not even done with it. But I'll put it in festivals. I'll put it everywhere. And at the very least, I'm going to put it on YouTube or on all my platforms. And who knows who picks that up or who knows who takes one of those songs. Um, so I, I think there's... Yes, you could hobnob and socialize a lot more when I was coming up, mm -hmm. but you can reach more people now that the, now that the younger generation is coming up. I couldn't reach all those people. Right. So, you know, now you're getting discovered on YouTube or Instagram. Um, 
I was watching, you know, this show Bridgerton. I was watching the girl who wrote the Bridgerton, the musical. I don't know if you guys were following that. And all she was doing was putting stuff on Instagram. She that will turn into a play. Absolutely. Absolutely. So she did that from her Instagram. Um, so you can there's there's actually more opportunity, I think, now than when I was coming up. Right. Now, you know, even even at the height of um everything that you had going on, the success that was garnered, um, like you said, you know, coming in the game on a whim and a prayer, you know, it, it you know, it happened, creating so much magic and creating a lot of opportunities um for a lot of actors, um, musicians, you know, you 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 got burned out with it and um decided to retire for you know for a few years or whatever. Yeah. You know, um with with doing that, do you think that that at the, you know it's necessary for um because a lot of artists you know and, and actors and stuff they go and they that self destruct yeah do you think that you know with having the psychology background and stuff like that do you think that 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 plays a part in it and it's necessary to kind of like take a break at times and and, and back away a, a little bit to gather yourself. I 100% do. I used to speak at a lot of colleges and I haven't in a while, but my number one rule that I would say to anybody who's breaking into any business, I don't care what business you're in, is balance, have a balance. And we all think that nothing can get done if we don't do it. And so you see these people who think that they're doing more than everybody else because they're working, they're burning the, the, the candle. They only talk about film or TV or football or whatever, you know, job that you're in. And, you know, the number one thing that people say on their deathbed is they wish they didn't work so much. Mm -hmm. And so for me and my psychology background, I was becoming very masculine. I was the, one of the first female distributors, period. There wasn't any. And so I was groundbreaking and setting the role for others, but I was in a very male dominated field. Now there's a lot of different girls. When I was coming up, there wasn't but that didn't mean I had to turn into one. And I right. was, I was a hundred percent losing my femininity and I'm a girl from the South. So for me, it was very important that I step back or I would not have been who I am today. Um, I just, you know, all of a sudden I'm cussing like a truck driver and <laughs> I mean, like I was the guy and I just didn't want to be, it was the, it was the antithesis of what I wanted to be. And then after taking years off, there was a time when I said, I'm coming back, but now weekends are my own. And when I'm off, I'm off. And when I travel, that's it, you know? And when I'm on, I'm on, it's, you know, there's just a balance. I, you know, you have to enjoy life. Right, absolutely. You know, what would you say that you love about the entertainment business and that you dislike about it with all of the years looking back all the way up until this point now? Um, what I love about it is, well, I love creativity. There's nothing better to me than to find a story that you didn't know about, especially the true stories. I get to learn so much and break it and see it come to life in front of you. That's amazing. Um, also I've traveled around the world. I know people around the world. Um, the opportunities that the entertainment business can put you into are extraordinary. I mean, you know, the fact that literally I can go to almost every country and pick up the phone and know somebody is something I personally love. I, I'm, you know, that's the greatest a asset to me for the film business because I love, love, love to travel and experience cultures. The bad thing about the entertainment business is that are the things that you hear. Um, it is a very difficult business. Um, the majority of people will never make money in it. Um, I don't care if you're an actor or a producer or a writer, it's a very small group that is lucky enough to make it, to actually make a living. Um, it's incredibly hard. And when you do get a job, it doesn't mean you're going to get another one. So you are living from job to job. And there's a lot of really bad people in this industry, especially, you know, a lot of people come to Hollywood just to get famous or or they, they're not making money and so they try to rip off whoever they can because they might not ever work again. So you really have to weed out a lot in this business. Um, and that's unfortunate because ultimately I think people just start off wanting to be good filmmakers or, or actors. You know, I think the intention starts real and then changes a bit. 
Right. You know, that, that, that heads into my next question. I want to ask you, you know, because it is a lot going on and we do hear a lot of things that go on in the business, you know, which, um, you know, sparked the Me Too movement yeah, yeah. and stuff like that or whatever. A lot of people speaking out and speaking their truth about a lot of things, which is shocking to, you know, the consumer audience. Um, you know, mentally, you know, with you being in the business and being connected um, to so many different people from friends to business associates and stuff like that, does it affect you mentally um, in a way when, when, you know, you may hear something or whatever that's like, wow, like, you know, I was cool with this person and then this other person that I'm cool with or whatever, you know, this happened. And then it's like, you know, you're sort of like in the middle in a way or whatever. Like, does it mentally affect you in a way, you know, hearing all of this stuff or, or you know, maybe seeing things and then going the other way? Like, yo, this is not, you know. I mean, it does. And look, a lot of a lot of my friends actually got me too last year and I was surprised, um, you know, disappointed and surprised. And I was a girl coming up and I experienced my own fair share of things, um, although I'm a very strong girl. So um, any situation that I might have unknowingly got myself into, I certainly got myself out of. So I didn't have some of the horror stories, but I had a sex therapy background and maybe I could handle myself better than the most. But I don't think the film business has it worse than other businesses. I really don't. I think people look at Hollywood because it's under a microscope and because it is Hollywood. So everybody is looking at it. But from my friends that are in regular retail businesses or, you know, contractors or any business, they have the same issues that we do. We're just more under a microscope. Um, and more visible for people to gossip about and talk about and everything else. And look, there are some that make a stupid amount of money at a very early age and feel indestructible. And it's a shame that psychology doesn't prepare them. And there's too many people saying yes without enough no's that it gets out of control. And um, it, that's unfortunate. Right. You, you ever think that it will... Um find some form of balance or whatever to where um or or this is just the way that it's been and because i think that in a way you know like you said you do go out there with the big eyes and the stars and all of this stuff or whatever and you're super excited about it or whatever and then when you actually get into those type of positions you know like you know the the famous couch for yeah. instance, you know, um, you know, I've had several people on here who's, you know, yeah. who've attested that the couch does exist and that these type of things are happening or whatever. I mean, is that just the business or is it just? Look, I think it. I a lot of that was the business. I will mm -hmm. tell you that that won't happen very much anymore. The Me Too movement is real, and people are talking now. And mm -hmm. so those casting couches existed a lot more when I was coming up. And um, I think anybody who tries to get away with that now runs the risk of being outed because people are really talking. So I don't, I think all the movements that are happening right now are gonna stop Hollywood from doing half the things that they did wrong in the past. I really do. I think, I think there will be a better Hollywood five years from now. I don't think the casting couches will exist. Obviously movies are becoming more diverse, um, you know, now there's also female writers and directors where there weren't before, you know, there's African-American leads in the majority of the movies. I think Hollywood's desperately trying to right its wrongs. And I think, and I hope it'll be a much better Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it is amazing um, to see the transformation because if you really, really pay attention to a lot of things, you you, you do actually see a, a lot more people um, of, of diversity on you know, commercials, things that you would have never saw back in the days or whatever. So I think that it is heading in a um, in a great direction and actually hearing it from you or from that that inside perspective brings a little bit more comfort that we're heading in, in the right direction. It's going to take some time. It's not just going to happen overnight, but but we are seeing things happen and I'm, I'm really, really uh, happy about that. Yeah. You know, now your life has been um, magical and um, you have been around the world and seen so many different amazing things. Um, what would you say is the most unforgettable moment um, 
since your stint working in the business. And I know it's probably so many of them, but maybe the most standout one, if you can think of it. God, I actually don't know. There's so many amazing opportunities that I've had that I, I'm trying to think of what I would think is the most. There's so many. I got to go to Serbia and stand in the middle of the square during the student uprising of the Milosevic government coming down because I was shooting a movie there. Um, and that was pretty outstanding. Um, I got to meet President Reagan when he was um, had just come out of office because of the business. Um, I, you know, I don't even know. Um, I don't know what my favorite thing would be. I, there's so many, um, you know, I, I don't really know. When I was shooting the movie, Very Bad Things, um, that movie was special. I mean, I got I love to- that movie. Thank you. I got to get Peter Berg as first directorial ever. Um, Cameron Diaz was a sweetheart. We became friends and still are. Christian Slater and I are still friends. I just saw Jeremy Piven the other day. I mean, um, you know, I don't, there's so many incredible moments that happen that, you know, that I don't know. I mean, during COVID lockdown, my birthday was May 7th and it was a depressing birthday. It was all by myself. Nobody could go anywhere. A couple good hearted friends bought over toilet paper and dropped it off at my door because we were all afraid to see each other. But I got an Emmy two days prior. So right. like that, I mean, it's like, you know, that was a definite amazing moment. I mean, I had an Emmy delivered to my greatest birthday gift ever. So yeah. uh, I don't Congratulations know. on that as well. Thank you. And then I'm very charitable. And because of my business, it allows me to do more charity work. Um, and um, those are amazing moments too. I mean, you know, um, you know, I've definitely gotten to do a lot more because of the visibility of the business. Right. Um, now, is, has it ever been any project that you might have passed on and wish that you would have been a part of it? Like, dang, I blew it. I wish I would have been a part of this. I love this. I am lucky to say no. I've seen a lot of movies that I passed on that came out and tanked. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> that. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I'm very, 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 very picky. And um, most people know that if I'm coming on, you know, we're going to make it and, you know, no, I, I don't think there is actually. Thankfully. You you love you love the music side of it or you love the uh the film side of it or it's just an organic combination for you. It's an organic combination. I mean, the film side, we're trying to break three real stories right now and I'm going after books to option and I love doing the real stories. You know, I'll make a lot of action and thriller and horror and stuff in the course of so I can pay my bills, but telling a true story is my passion. I've never been able to bridge music and film and we're about to now. I have the rights to um, a story that's loosely based on in sync, and uh, it centers on these real life girls who went to college and um, didn't want to be there. They wanted to be traveling around the world or at least around America within sync. And so they, they ended up going the price is right in hopes of winning the RV. So they would have wheels and a house or a roof over their head so they could do this. And we got their life story and it's gonna be the first musical that I'm gonna do. And I'm super excited about it. We're gonna be one big ode to the nineties and hopefully work with some of the biggest nineties you know, pop stars and, um, you know, hopefully turn it into a Broadway play afterwards. And I'm so excited to be doing a musical. Right. Transitioning, um, you know, being that things are heading, you know, are more in the streaming space now and, you know, you come up in a different era. Um, has the transition been difficult for you as far as like, um, doing things a different way or it was easy for you to just transition over or has it been difficult for any of your uh, of, of your friends or constituents that you work with in the business from yeah. that time period i think that those of us that came up in the future world are going to have it a little bit i mean we're going to be starting like everybody else is starting i i haven't done a movie for netflix or amazon yet i know people at Netflix and Amazon who run those streamers. But um, I'm used to setting up something at a studio, <laughs> right. 
deals that have my back, you know, my back end bonuses and whatever else. It's very different, very different. Um, again, the younger ones coming up might have it a bit easier or the voices that come up, but, um, but I'm now for the first time nosing around um, getting into TV more because I have to say the television shows right now rival the, the theatricals that are coming out. I mean, I, I think TV has never been better. And so I'm going to be learning that, that side of the business, you know, along with everybody else. And again, I have to start from the bottom then. I mean, I'll have a little bit of an edge because I've done so much in film, right. but not an edge because, you know, producing a series is very different than producing a film. And that's right. where I want to go. I think what Netflix and Amazon and Disney and these streaming platforms have done with some of these incredible series, um, you know, everything Reese Witherspoon is attached to and, you know, even the Bridgertons of the world, a show that I typically wouldn't have watched and then was so engrossed with are, are amazing. Just absolutely amazing. Right. You know, it's funny that you say that because, you know, I, I, I've, I've had a few people on that that's, that feels like um, the TV world, um, that the apps are, are kind of taking over. Yeah. Cable, cable TV, um, as we knew it, is kind of withering a little bit. And they're trying to find their, find their space in the game yeah. um, because everything is going to app you know, app TVs, you know, uh, BT plus app and all of this or whatever. Um, and, and, and to hear you, to hear you still be excited, you know, about TV or whatever is, 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 is um, it's interesting to me. It's interesting. I actually am so impressed with the group that is coming up. I, you know, like I said, I, my generation was good this group coming up is even better. And for any of us to sit around and kid ourselves and think they're not is an understatement because they are, they're really good. There's so many more tools and things at their disposal. And again, even the whole diversity angle, we had to write for a certain age and demographic of society. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you get to do all kinds of things and take chances and, you get you take the right chance and it works. You've just become a star overnight. Yeah, you heard about that. We've seen uh, even within COVID, we've seen a lot of a lot of people became millionaires within COVID. Yeah. Figured out you know new ideas and right. you know TikTok exploding and and right. you know bringing it to life. So you know we have been being entertained and a lot of people have uh, found out. A lot of people kind of fell through the cracks too. You know because all they knew was and wasn't you know, really planning for the future because they were moving around a lot and doing a whole bunch of things, not foreseeing that part of it ever just being paused yeah. or whatever. So, you know, they kind of was, was stuck in a way. Um, you know, it, it has been so, so much that's been going on that we've been dealing with, you know, coming out of last year into this year or whatever. We're having so many um, friends uh, from all different walks of life and, and, and all different races or whatever. And the current space that we're in right now um, with, you know, division being out there, um, you know, injustices and all these different things that, that, you know, been going on, but now with phones and everything being so visible now to everybody and, and you know, in, in, on your side in the business, um, like I say, with having a lot of friends from all different walks of life, different colors or whatever, um, has anything ever, you know, has things been strained a little bit on your end um, with just hearing people's different thoughts on different things? It's been such an emotional roller coaster with everything. I don't think anything's been strained on my end. I actually think it's, it's allowed conversations to happen that if you are open enough to have, it will solidify your relationships even more. The sad thing and the only thing that does strain is the political divide. And I keep trying to meet people in the middle um, and it seems impossible. And I don't understand, I, you know, I used to look at the Republican and Democratic party and I don't want to get political, but I would always think, why do we have these parties? We should, we should vote for the best candidate. I don't, I never used to think we should have two parties. Right. And now the divide is, is, so extreme that if you're a Democrat, you're a liberal left. Well, maybe you're not. 
And if you're a Republican, you are so staunch, it means that you're anti everything. Well, maybe you're not. What, you know, how come we can't have a discussion? Something obviously was very wrong. Um, so let's try to make it right. But that has hurt. I, I've, you know, as much as I would like to be friends with everybody, I have some friends that you just can't. They're right. so just lecturing me instead of talking to me that um, it's unfortunate, but that's happening to everybody. You know, whoever thought that, whoever thought that, that would happen? <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's, Crazy. it's, it's amazing. It, it, it really, really, I, I just think that the last, um, Four years, you know, the, uh, the things that um, we have seen take place, you know, um, I, I have a little age on me, too. I'm not that old, but um, I have a little age. I've seen been around long enough to to see some abnormal things take place. Right. And, and you know, I don't never think that it's been um, this much tension um, with everything. And, and to me, you know. I'm not gonna lie. My, my personal opinion, though, I feel like um, it was necessary, and I feel like a lot of things were exposed. We were able to see behind the curtain and kind of see how things go and really see people. Yeah. I, I rather honestly and know, like, oh, okay, so that's how you really feel about it. That you know, it, we can navigate a little yeah. bit more and not have to be around certain situations and no thinking that it's one thing and then it's not really that. So for that, I do appreciate Absolutely. things just the veil, the curtain being pulled back where we can really kind of see a lot of things. Cause I don't really, you know, fault that particular situation um, all the way. I just feel like we all have to take some accountability when we allow certain things to just happen, knowing that you know the 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 education part of it's not there the you know what i mean like we've never seen that before yep. so what do you expect <laughs> I mean, yep. like you know what i mean so um that should open conversations for people to understand instead of attack and that's the problem people are so busy attacking instead of talking and i don't right. understand that I, I don't understand it let me ask you this just while I have you and we on it before we get off of this um this subject or whatever. Um, do you think that with having uh seats being held, okay, now we in 2021. Okay, do you think that with seats being held until the end of time till you just kick the bucket? Um, do you think that that plays a role in perspective and understanding change? where we at right now? Like, do you think that seats should be held for, for a while? No, I think we're all to that. No, I think it's, I think it's unfortunate and, um, and it, it's just unfortunate. I mean, we've got a, you know, whether it's Supreme Court judge or, you know, half, you know, some of these people in offices of a lifetime. Yeah, it's bad. Um, it's bad. You know, thought processes change, but sometimes the older you get, the more stuck in your ways you are. And um, right. yeah, it's not good. Right. Now, you know, how does it feel winning the Woman of the Year award? Now, we got to talk about that, you know. And also, I want to talk about um, your, uh, your time and your passion that you spend on, you know, you're really big on charities. Yeah. And um, I, I would like to talk about that, the feeling of winning that award and um, just the giving back that you do on a consistent basis. Um, Woman of the Year and the Humanitarian of the Year, those two awards um, were better than anything. I mean, better than anything. And um, it's just such an honor to be recognized amongst like literally really your peers. I had no idea when I won Woman of the Year that it was going to be Woman of the Year. I knew it was being honored, but it was amazing because they had put together this compilation in this video where they took some movies and videos of some of my friends talking and things I had done. And I didn't expect any of that. And then my girlfriend, Tracy Bregman, an amazing actress on a soap opera, Young and the Restless, did this incredible speech and all these various actors and musicians from Boy George to, I can't even remember, Francis Fisher, Diane Warren, um, I can't even remember, all these amazing people had 
you know, said things um, about me. And first of all, that was incredible because um, those things probably don't happen to most people and for most people, unfortunately, until they're dead. Right, Literally, right. It was kind of like being at my own, you know, um, I hate to say my own funeral, but hearing the things that people would say when you're no longer around to hear what they're saying and to right. watch what they're saying. But to be alive and to see it, I can't tell you. I was so emotional. I literally was because I just do what I do. And I, you know, I, I don't expect anything, you know, for it. I think that's another thing. When people give, give from your heart, not because you want something back. Um, the gratitude that you can do it should be all you need to, to get you to do something great. But to get an award for doing what you do anyways, and to be able to hear how you might have made a difference in people's lives. Um, I never expected it. So again, it it made me quite emotional and feeling right. like I forget. it was the greatest feeling ever. You know, um, what's, what's, what's so intriguing to me is um, the humbleness of it all. You know what I mean? Like um, your position um, from the outside looking in, it's like a dream to people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're living it. You know what I mean? Um, like, what does that feel like for you? And how do you stay so grounded and so inspired? Because you're still helping people. You're still working with people. You're not acting a certain type of way. You know, you're still showing love to people, even at the level that you're on right now. I mean, for God's sakes, you was hugging Obama and them and, and, and biting them. I'm saying like, yeah. you don't just be able to do that. You don't just have that type of access like that. So like, how do you do it? You know, I think growing up in the South was an amazing thing. And I had a great family that raised me the right way. And my family, you know, I started working when I was 16 in a clothing store and then I went and worked in physical therapy and then I grew up like going to college and doing things. And, you know, I'm blessed that I was grounded before I ever came to Hollywood. And that is a good thing. I would not have wanted to be a child star in Hollywood because I can only imagine how their footing is so loose. Um, and for me, I had to do things like I told you, which was retire for a bit. I felt myself changing, but, um, I'm a geek, I really am. Every time I am invited on a red carpet and I don't even know how many I've gone on, to me, it's the first time. And every time I'm with somebody, they're like, how are you still so excited about this? And I am, I'm, right. I'm smart enough to know that at any moment it could all be taken away. It can, and that's why I'm nice to every single person because the guy serving you popcorn at the movie theater could be the next big film director. Right. So I am nice to absolutely everybody. And when you go in with that attitude that this is my moment, but this moment can be taken away, you will stay grounded. So even like when I go to concerts, I love, love, love music. And every time I go to a concert, it's like the first time. I am, if I'm there, I'm in, I am just loving it. My thing to kids is put your cell phones down and enjoy the moment. You know, it's okay if you want to take your Instagram video or whatever. I'm guilty of it too. You want to say you're here, here it is, film it. But then put your phone down and enjoy it. I think yeah. the biggest problem that the kids are going to have nowadays is they're not enjoying the moment. They're so busy wondering if everybody else is going to think they're cool enough that the moment is passing. And before they know it, you know, I don't understand how they're even getting social skills. Writing somebody on Instagram and picking up the phone and talking to them are two different things. Oh, my God. So, I don't understand how the social skills are going to stay intact and COVID's not helping. So my big worry is the children, the 10 years and younger or the 12 years and younger kids that are that have had to grow up in a decade of guns and violence and politics and COVID. How do they stay social and grounded and normal? And that's going to be a big attribute to those parents to make sure that, you know, they get eyeball time, not cell phone, right. eyeball time. You know, um, it's funny that you say that too, because um, I, I, I love the way that you break things down and it's coming from a, a real seasoned place. Yeah. Um, do you think that, because, you know, a few years ago, I just seen a slight change with, you know, when the reality TV thing started to jump off. And I just feel like it really kind of ruined 
um, a lot of things in a way because of the way things are being depicted in a way. It's almost like, you know, I can write those things because you know exactly what's going to happen. Do you think that they're strategically done that way like that? And why? Why, why can't we see a reality show of successful women, all successful and basically showing girls how you can, you know, become this business owner and have this boutique or are uh, we all getting along? Or I, I mean, like, why does it have to be depicted and we all get together? It's a fight. The glass is being thrown or whatever. And yada, yada, yada. Um. So I'm about to get into reality TV for the first time ever. And I'm going to tell you how I'm doing it and it will speak to what you want. Um, but to answer your question of why, because that's what people want. Mm. If, if news stories are going to pop up on your phone and you're the average, you know, housewife in the Midwest or wherever, and a story pops up over so-and-so opened a business today and made, you know, X amount of money, or some actors slept with somebody and their career is on fire, what are they gonna hit on? They're gonna hit on the salacious stuff. Right. This is the generation of gossip. And that's the other thing. People love to tear people down right now. They can't get enough of it. Who's screwing over who? What's happening? Like, you know, there's so many crazy stories out there. My big worry is we're being desensitized by all these stories. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about these reality shows like The Bachelor and Bachelor in Paradise and all these crazy shows where everybody's sleeping with everybody and everybody's right. backstabbing everybody. I, I don't I don't know. I didn't grow up that way. We didn't. We didn't. So no, at all. At all. So I'm I don't know how kids are going to grow up wanting a monogamous relationship or whatever when they're watching those kind of shows and realizing you can have anybody. Yeah, you can go on an app, swipe right, slate left, dial up somebody. They'll all come over. It's crazy. But, I, you know, I'm getting into reality and I'll do a plug for the person that I found. And actually, he was featured on The View today. And this was just somebody that out of the blue I found and it's more inspirational. If I'm going to get in reality, it'll be inspirational. And, um, my nephew works for somebody who had just bought an airport and the airport was supposed to be abandoned. And my nephew went to check the airport out and he found that there was a man squatting basically and had an office at the airport, an African-American guy around 30. And my nephew, before he kicked him out, started talking to him and he came to California and he was telling me this story about this guy that he met at the airport. Turns out this guy um, plug for this guy. His name is Barrington Irving. Um, this is a good example for all your listeners of how you can over, how you, you can succeed with every obstacle against you. This was a guy who came from Jamaica at a very young age, ended up moving to a, the poorest area of Miami and had no money to his name. He was standing in line at McDonald's one day and he sees a wealthier African-American guy pull up, probably driving a town car or something. Barrington had never, never seen a man of color with a car like that. So he looked at him with these wide eyes. He was probably 10. And he said, are you a drug dealer? And the guy said, no. And he said, well, what do you do? And the guy said, I'm a pilot. And Barrington said, is that, what do you make? And the guy said, I make about a hundred grand. And Barrington said, is that legal? And the guy said, it is. And that guy ended up mentoring Barrington. He said, wow. I remember and come to the airport and I'll teach you what you need to know around, about planes. Barrington Irving at the age of 17 with $30 in his name, decided he wanted to fly around the world. Nobody sponsored him. He didn't know where he was gonna get the money. So he built the plane. It's called the inspiration. And he was the youngest guy, youngest African-American man to fly around the world. And then he took all of the knowledge and he got singled out by Obama and by Oprah. He won the Nat Geo award. but rather than resting on his laurels, he decided he was gonna teach. And he now mentors 600 schools in America wow. where, he, where he has the flying classroom. And he takes students on adventures that they would never get to see in his plane to teach them all different kinds of things. And so my nephew wasn't pitching a show. He was telling me about this guy. And I said, wait, this is Bear Grylls meets Bill Nye the science guy. I'm gonna sell him. And so, I'm in the process of making Barrington Irving a household name because he's a prime example of he had nothing going for him. 
and he did it. And those are the kind of stories I want to tell. And we'll tell them entertaining. And hopefully some kid will get inspired by Barrington, like he got inspired by this pilot. And we can pay it forward. You know, that's amazing. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? And I was shocked today that The View, um, Whoopi Goldberg, at the start of Black History Month, featured Barrington Irving today. I didn't even know how she knows him, but it was like, yes. So, um, yeah, it was great. I want to talk to Trump before we get out of here. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, some proud moments, too. Um, and I want to talk about the infamous house that you have, too, as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful right here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. And look at this. Oh, thank you. How does that feel to be on the covers of these magazines? It's amazing. I mean, you know, who would have thought that I would be a cover girl? Um, it's pretty incredible, I have to say. Um, again, I don't, I don't even have a publicist. I never have my whole life. People are always like, "Who does your publicity?" I'm like, "No one." Um, so, you know, again, I'm the kind of person that you work hard, you just do what you do, and if somebody stops to recognize you for it, it just it's amazing, you know, it just makes me laugh and feel good. So um, it's great. I got to be, right. you know. This, this house of yours is just, yeah. I, I'm in love with it right there. Look at this right here. Yeah. You really killed this shoot right here, seriously. Yeah, thank you. Look at this, amazing. Thank you. Amazing, like this layout was, absolutely amazing to be able yeah. to do it at your house and you got these amazing neighbors these I am I mean, what, what is that what is that like having one of my know, neighbors unfortunately moved last year which bummed me out because i had david beckham on the side of me um but jay leno is still behind me and he is a sweetheart if i tell my friends if you know pre-covid if you're walking down the street and jay's driving by he's the nicest man he always stops and says hello to people and he is an incredible man i also have bruce springsteen up the street but i've never what? got to that's why i bought my house i was a massive in fact one of the first concerts that i ever geeked out and stood overnight to get tickets for was the boss bruce springsteen when i was at school in louisiana and so um Unfortunately, this is just his LA house. I'm sure he's most of the time in Jersey, but when I was looking for a house and I found out that the boss lived up the street, you know, from the geeky little girl that grew up in Hollywood, Florida, not Hollywood, California, to live down the street from the boss who was my idol was everything. That was like wow. really, I made it. Yeah. That's, that's that's amazing. amazing. Look, um, is it anything else that you would like to um, plug in? Anything that we can look forward to in the future? You just dropped the gem on us um, of something that we can look forward to. Is it anything else that um, you have coming up? Projects, songs? They're kind of all over the place. Like I said, people don't know me as a songwriter. My short will be done and out this year, and that will bring me back into the music business. The In Sync. Um, movie is one of my favorite movies um, that is being written by Rachel Bloom, who is incredible and has her own huge fan base. Um, I'm also doing an incredibly scary movie for Screen Gems. Um, yeah, and that one is based on the first exorcism ever broadcast live on TV in the 70s and what happened to the family that lived in the house. It is pre Amityville horror, pre poltergeist. The only ghost thing out there was um, Casper, the friendly ghost, and this was not friendly. So it is amazing that nobody had ever told this story before and I'm super excited to tell that. I've got a huge action movie that we're prepping right now um, that will come out probably in two years. The problem is most of our movies are getting pushed with COVID. I was right. supposed to be shooting last year and, and we've gotten pushed, um, but you know, um, and now I'm looking for my Oscar biopic and I'm close to narrowing in on one, um, in which case hopefully, uh, you know, traffic didn't get best picture. I want best picture. So I'm coming back to get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, before we get out of here, you know, we, we discussed so much stuff. Um, can you leave anybody that may be low in spirit, um, 
because there's so much going on with COVID, um, all of this racial tension, um, people have lost loved ones, people are, are affected by COVID, out of jobs, don't know what they're gonna do. Just can you leave them with some encouraging words? I mean, look, just know that you're not alone. All of us, no matter where you think we are in our life, have gone through a series of depression with COVID. We've, we're, you're not alone. And I think the biggest thing that people have to realize is they feel very isolated, very afraid, and very alone. You must figure out what makes you happy. And I don't mean, maybe that happiness is for a moment, but that moment can then stretch into two moments that then can stretch into an hour and can stretch into a day. Find that moment that makes you happy. I you know, found that I was staying in bed too long and just kind of slowly getting out when that wasn't the old me. And now I have taken to doing a 10 to 15 minute meditation that works for me, that puts me in a headspace. Next thing I do is I turn on music that gets me out of bed dancing all the way to the shower right. and I start my day in a happy mode. But the other thing that I wanna to say to you guys that are down, pick up the phone. Again, I can't stress as a former therapist, you are not alone. and if you can just pick up the phone, you will realize that everybody else is going through something similar to you. And as soon as you realize that, the isolation that you're feeling will start to disappear. It really will. And do something nice for people. It, you, I, I can't tell you guys how it will change your outlook. You might feel that you have absolutely no money, but you can feed yourself. And if you could take a morsel of that food and give it to someone homeless, you'll realize that you have something to be grateful for. And Absolutely. every single thing that you do, no matter how bad you think you are, find somebody who has a little bit worse than you, help them a little bit, and you'll realize that things could get a lot worse. That's my inspiration. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Ms. Cohen, I want to take this time just to thank you so much. I knew it was going to be amazing, though. I knew that. And I just want to thank you on behalf of me and my entire team. I just want to say thank you so thank much for this amazing opportunity. We would love to have you back on here again yeah, when these projects getting ready to drop. You got to come do your media run and come to. back on here so we can talk about it. Thank you again. We wishing you more blessings and more success with everything that you are doing right now and everything you're going to be doing in the future. It's great it's the, energy here and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's the Vibe Show with my special guest, the one and only, the very lovely Cindy Cohen. We are out of here. Cowan, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Cohen. Cowan. Cowan. Are Cowan. you serious? Said it wrong. You got to say it right. Cowan. Cindy Cowan. 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 <laughs> and please forgive me. I'm so no happy. That's why I'm just changing it at the end. <laughs> oh, and you know what? Where exactly at in Louisiana? You went to what? LSU? Uh, I really? Went to yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm in Baton Rouge right wave. now. I, you know, I'm a proud Green Wave and I, you know, I love the Saints. They were the Aints when I went to school. I I'll love them forever. Yeah. Wow. It. That's amazing. Make sure you continue to be safe out there when you're moving around. If you're moving around, make sure that you be safe. It's the Vibe Show 97.9 with my special guest, Cindy Cowan. There you go. All right. We love y'all. We out of here. That was my special guest, the one and only Cindy Cowan. Shout out to everybody who was on the check-in show my special guest so much love gs music vibe show casper 1701 alpha thomas chapman jacqueline yvette no jacqueline vp the vibe show and everybody else who showed my special guest so much love you guys continue to take care of yourself if you gotta go out please put the mask on sanitize your hands take care of yourself it's the vibe show i love y'all I'm out.